Hello and welcome to the Gabba for day two of the third test of the Border Kavaska Trophy Series. I'm Izzy Westbury. I've got here Mark Taylor and Brad Haddon. I'll give you a quick score summary for today because today, wow, probably the busiest of all days of the series so far. Australia started the day on none for 28. They lost both openers early to Jasper Bumrah. Who else? Then Travis Head and Steve Smith scored centuries, each in a 241-run stand. Head made 152, as you do, just continu continuing on from Adelaide. But it was Steve Smith with 101 that really, perhaps the talking point of the day, this came to an end uh, at the hands of Jasper Brumra. Again, we'll keep talking about him because he picked up a fiver um, after taking advantage of the second new ball. The harder they come, the faster they go, though, because while it sparked a little collapse, three wickets for 11 runs, it was a stand between Alex Carey and uh, Pat Cummins. Uh, 57, 58 runs in the end. Uh, they left Australia 7 for 405. So, gentlemen, a pretty good day's play for the Australians. Oh, absolutely. It sums up very well. It was a really good day when Australia were 3 for 75 when Marnus Labuschagne departed. That game could have gone either way. And yeah. as you talked about that innings from Travis Head, the 150, and Steve Smith getting his first 100 for 18 months, that's really turned the game in Australia's favour, albeit that we've lost a full day's play, or best part thereof. There's a bit of rain predicted for the next few days, but Australia now have 405 runs on the board and three days of cricket left. So Australia now are in the driving seat for the rest of the match. As we saw um, McSweeney and Kawaja, the two openers, depart, having added just 10 more to the score, I mean, it was Bumrah with both wickets. At that point, you're thinking, oh my goodness, here we go again, what's going to happen? Is it just the fact that Bumrah is too good for, for the Australian openers, or do they need to be a bit more proactive coming into the morning? I, I said yesterday, I think we've had some really good plans to, to Bumrah since the, the Perth test, but the one thing in his favour, he, he's just a high-class bowler. What we've tried to do, we've tried to be more proactive and not just look to survive, we've looked to score runs against Bumrah, but when he gets into that spell where the ball's swinging, he gets his length right, he's hard work. But what we did really well, and Travis Head does it better than anyone, he looks to take him on. He, he looks to score, and all of a sudden, the whole attitude of the game changes. Deep point goes out, deep square goes out, and the scoreboard keeps ticking. He can't build dot ball pressure, but when he's on and he's in that sort of uh, rhythm in his spell, he's hard to play, and, and that was once again today. But Travis Head, he, he turned the game again with 150 to run and ball. The way he's playing at the moment, he's playing a different game. But to me, it was all about Steve Smith. He's tinkered with his technique um, throughout this whole series. But today, it just looked like he went back to what worked from him. He crabbed across the crease. At times, he looked different. But that's the way Steve Smith's always played. He showed great con concentration. And as the Indians went on, he got his weight through the ball. And he started to get those attractive cover drives and pull shots that we know of Steve Smith. And one thing, Tubby, I think we were on at the time when, when early on in Smith's innings, he was really, he was struggling. And, oh. and it reminded me of a quote from Andy Murray, a tennis player, who said, you know, that the, the thing that separates the good from the best is that when they're out of form, they still manage to oh. deliver. And is that what we saw, saw from Steve Smith today? Absolutely. I was told many years ago by a great mentor of mine, a guy named Neil Marks, he said, it, it's the, 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 the best runs you can make are the tough ones. Yeah. And getting sometimes it might just be a tough 40. And today, if you watch Steve Smith, you'd think, hey, that's not the guy that was the man we remember from three, four, five years ago. But he was prepared to put his ego aside a bit to say, OK, I'm not looking great. I'm not feeling great. But I'm not going to get myself out. He, got a, you know, he had a bit of fortune. He got an inside edge that went over the stumps. He had a couple of close LBW decisions go his way. But he never, ever at any stage thought, I'm going to throw it away. And he kept hanging in there, hanging in there. Eventually, Boomer had to go off, and the other bowlers came in, and that's when he flourished. Um, and as Had said a moment ago, he started to play some of those trademark Smith drives. They're the only plays when he's in form. It's been peaks and troughs for a number of the key players in this series so far. We saw Coley get a century. Marnus had a few runs in the last test. But uh, there's a bit of, of, I don't know, wickedry or child play perhaps from Siraj and I quite enjoyed it from a, an English perspective because it brought back memories of Stuart Broad <laughs> fiddling yeah. with the bales of Marnus Labuschagne. Siraj seems to really be playing up to the villain role. I think he thrives off that. Well, I think he does. The interesting thing about that today is why does Marnus need to get involved? 
Siraj obviously got under his skin there and, and he reacted to what Siraj did where he grabbed the bale, Siraj turned on one side, he turned on the other. All Manus had to do was walk away. Let him have his time, he didn't say anything. He was just trying to get a reaction out of Manus because they know his personality. Mm. And four balls later, he played at a wide ball from Reddy that he didn't have to play at, mm. and, and he nicked it to slip. So to me, Siraj won the battle today because that's a battle he didn't need to get in. He started to get in the contest with bat versus ball. He started to move like we've seen Manus in the past, but those little moments there, mm. stay away from them. But presumably that also means that India know now how to get at Manus. In, in future tests, well, just get inside his head. They, they know they can get him involved. Yeah. The bottom line is you don't know if that was the actual thing that got him out, but you can bet that the Indian cricket side now will think, OK, well, if he's going to bite, we're going to keep throwing him a bit of bait. Uh, so that, that's the danger you have as a, as a batter when you get involved in that sort of, those sort of moments. As a bowler, you can get hit for four after something like that. We can all have a laugh and say, get back and bowl rather than fiddle with the bales. But the bowler's got another opportunity. He gets the next ball and the next over. As a batter, if you get involved in that and then get out, all of a sudden now you've got the Indian cricket team saying, aha, you might be playing a bit better, but we can get you involved. We can take your concentration away to something else by just playing with the bail. Next time it might be fiddling with the stumps or marking yep. centre for him or something like that. Well, the one thing, sorry, is the one thing Steve Smith did really well today, he actually got in his own bubble. And I know cricket's a team game, but sometimes batting is an individual thing. You've got to get yourself into that bubble. And there's a moment early in his innings where Marnus walked down to talk to him. And Steve Smith just turned his back and said, I'm OK, I'm OK. And he just wanted to get in his bubble. And, and Marnus at one stage was also standing in his spot. He moved him. Today, I reckon Steve just went back to, I'm getting in my bubble and I'm going to do what I do well. Does it look pretty? Is it different? That's OK. I'm one of the best problem solvers the game has ever seen. And, and maybe Marnus can take a bit of a lesson from that because, as I said before, you don't need to get involved in that. The way he played Siraj and Boomer in the test in Adelaide, he looked him in the eye, stood up to him, but he was in a contest there. There, they just got under his skin and they won the battle. Kohli got his first century in 18 months in, um, back in Perth. Smith has got his first century for 18 months as well. Marnus yet to get to three figures. It might be the case that Australia only bat once in this test with weather to calm and then looking to make a big score. 12 from 55 balls. Is he a concern or is it is that a bit early to say so? No, I don't think so. I, I, I watched him today and, and as I had to sum it up very well, uh, 12 out of 55 is not a great score, but he actually looked pretty good, Marnus. And he said, he's, I think Hads' advice is very good and very sound that just worry about batting. It's hard enough as it is. You only got to make one mistake and you're out. Just worry about that. And he was good in Adelaide. He looked good again today, even though he got stuck a little bit on eight, I think, for a long time. But he started to look better and started getting himself going. And then he got involved in that bit of by play. So I, I wouldn't be worried about that. I don't think he's concerned. That the major concern for me is the top order, the very top order. Our, our one and two at the moment haven't got a run between them. I've, McSweeney's got a 39 in Adelaide. Apart from that, that's our last area of concern. That be nice for one if not both of those guys to get going obviously from McSweeney's point of view to kick start his career and from Usman's point of view is to keep people at bay who are now starting to think well do we need to find a second opener particularly with the Ashes coming up next year that's going to be a problem that Australia will have if Usman and and uh, and, and, and McSweeney don't make, make some runs in the next couple of test matches. Well, on any team, I guess, nothing's going to be perfect. And certainly when you know that coming in down the order is someone like Travis Head, because he just, goodness me, he's talked about Steve Smith, and, uh, you know, a wonderful century to get back in form. But Travis Head, he looks as though he's playing on a completely different mm. pitch, Hads. Well, the one thing I find with Travis Head is it actually doesn't matter what the surface is. He'd be a nightmare to bat behind. Because if the surface is going through the tops, keeping low, swinging around, he finds a way to score and hit the middle mm. of the bat. And the one thing he does better than most at the moment, he hits good balls to different parts of the ground. You can hit a ball top of off, you can play it beautifully down the ground. Or if you come in, um, <laughs> the boys are up and about there today. <laughs> good day. Um, it, what he does do well, he hits those balls in different areas. And when you're playing someone like that, you, you don't know what to do. You, you don't know, do I go short, do I go wide? Because he puts so much pressure back on the bowler. And the, other, and the other thing he's done is he's thrown the Indians out. Because yeah. they haven't stuck to a plan yet, have they? They, they, they know he scores well through point, uh, but they now just push point back. Which means, that, okay, they've, 
they're saving a few boundaries, but he's still hitting the odd boundary there, and he's got a release shot. He's off strike a lot. They haven't gone at him a lot. They've done it a little bit, but not a lot. So they're still going for runs leg side and off side. So they haven't really stuck to a plan yet, Travis said, because I think A, he's been too good, um, um, but B, they really need to stick at a plan for a lot longer because at the moment he's taking the game away from them. I can see the, the newspaper headlines already, heady heights or something along those lines. <laughs> but having said that, this goes to an interesting point that you just raised there, um, Tubbs, is that in that second session, no Australian wickets fell. Mm. And it really did look as though India kind of were looking for answers and didn't have anything. Mm. Rohit Sharma's captaincy has already been under scrutiny this series. Once again, do we think maybe a little few questions around that? They did look a bit flat at times today, which is obviously the, you know, the part and parcel of that is, is, is the captain and, and obviously the, your keeper. Rish, Rishat Pant was quiet at times again today. The, the hardest thing about Test Match Cricket in the field is when things are going bad. It's often the case when you're a captain and, and things are going well, everyone's around you. Everyone's got ideas of, what you, of who you should bowl, what field settings. When things get a bit tough, and that middle session was none for 130 to Australia, that's when you need people to say, hey, have we thought about this? Are we going to try that? And let's keep it up, boys. We need to just find a wicket, because eventually they did find a wicket, and they found three in 11 runs. It can change like that, but you need to make the effort when things are tough. To, to make that change, and that's got to come from the top down. Hads, just as Travis Head is becoming a sort of regular feature of this podcast for the series he's having, another man is Jasper Bumrah. I mean, his statistics alone are amazing. He's averaging 11 in the series. All other Indian bowlers are averaging 41. Mm. And in terms of wickets, he's got 17. The next best bowler, Mitchell Stark, has only got 11. I mean, are there more superlatives that we can use to describe the man? No, there's not. Um, he just needs some help. It's as simple as that. I, I thought Deep bowled really well in partnership with him today. He built a lot of pressure. He bowled a lot fuller than the other Indian bowlers and challenged the outside edge of, of Steve Smith's bat. But Boomer is the one. You've got Australia, if they can find a way to get through him, all of a sudden the game becomes a di different beast. And we've seen the way Travis Head plays against him. He looks to score and the game changed. But tomorrow's going to be an interesting day. It, it, if the sun comes out, it'd be great to see Australia bat for a session actually and get some more overs in Boomer. We've seen Siraj, he, he went off with, with Thinks Cramp, but he looks like he's struggling a little bit. Boomer, once he got to 20 overs in, in Adelaide, he, he pulled up sore. So it's all about finding a way to win the series. And, and it might be a moment tomorrow where we keep Boomer out there for another hour, it's hot, it's, it's humid out there, and he starts to get some fatigue in those legs because we've got to find some way to, to nullify his effect on the, um, the whole series. Well, he seems absolutely awful to have to play against. However, having said that, Tubby, uh, is he in danger of becoming the sort of single point of failure for India? This is the first time we've had a, a Border Gavaskar Trophy series with five tests in it for what, mm. a couple of decades now. I mean, he's got to bowl through another two, te two tests yeah. after this. Is that a concern for India? Well, it will be a, a major concern for them, uh, particularly if Australia do happen to win this test match. Now, mind you, we're a long way from that situation. But if Australia can get themselves in front, and, and, and you, when you've got those figures from one of your strike bowlers of India, averaging, what, 11, 17 yeah, wickets, yeah. and you're down 2-1, that would worry me if yeah. I was an yeah. Indian side because he is, at the moment, the single and only point of focus because he's getting the ball a bit fuller, He's got the ability to bowl to Smith, angle the ball in and still take it away a bit. And when he goes around the wicket to someone like Kawaja or a left-hander, he does exactly the same. He angles it in and then swings it away. So he's a fine bowler. And at the moment, he's Australia's really only major concern because everyone else is not even really playing a huge support role at the moment. They're just, they're just bowling the other overs because Australia aren't anywhere near as concerned with them as they are with Jasper Boomer. Well, from my perspective, with no skin in the game, it's just absolutely glorious to mm. watch. Really good cricket out there. And it's been a really tumultuous day, jam-packed day. So I guess the inevitable question is, Hads, you can't say rain. <laughs> what happens next? What happens? If we get no rain tomorrow, I think Australia are going to try to bat as long as they can. Um, get a huge first in his total, keep India out there um, for a session. Um, maybe have a go just before lunch, but I, I think they'll bat as deep as they, they can because if, if you keep them out there, get these batters standing out there for, for another session. It was hot and humid today. It, it was really hot and humid, so I, I think we're going to see Australia get around 450 um, and India have got their chance to bat. All right, bear in mind, every run Australia make is an extra run that um, India have to make to avoid the follow-on. Australia look to score quickly tomorrow, I think, as you say, another 50 runs they'd love really quickly and then think if they get to 450, 
India need to make 251 or Australia can enforce the follow-on. That becomes a big figure later tomorrow and into day four. Well, there you go. You heard it here first. Bat once, bat big and try and hope the rain stays yeah. away. Uh, which means that we're on to the final segment of the podcast, our secret cricket club questions. And Ajuni asks, well, this is apt, is head officially the father of India oh. had? <laughs> well, I, I definitely, he's playing a different game to everyone at yep. the moment. Um, the, the way he comes out, no matter what the situation is, he counter-attacks, um, the ball's going past everyone's outside edge, they're ducking around inside edge, but Travis Head finds a way to score, finds a way to get the uh, momentum back to Australia and put pressure on the Indian bowlers. So, yeah, he can call himself whatever he wants at the moment because he's in one of those purple patches. Joel's got a question, which I'm going to put down to hindsight as a wonderful thing. Was there ever any doubt that Smith would make 100 in this series, Tubby? Uh, well, we asked the same question about Virat Kohli, didn't we? The, the answer is it's hard to keep a good player down, even when he's not at his very best, and Steve Smith is not at his very best just yet. Either is Virat Kohli, but they know how to make hundreds. Steve Smith's now got 33 of them. Yeah, that's the right. The second most by an Australian behind Ricky Ponting. He knows how to make hundreds, and he's still desperate to score them. So the answer is we should never have doubted him, and I don't think many people did. Well, he's got to stick around for a bit because Ponting made 41. 41. So uh, he'll be around, I'm sure. Jace asks, uh, have you guys ever seen a batsman alter his stance and pre-delivery movements like Steve Smith? He is incredible. Hads. Well, Steve Smith's forever tinkering with his technique. We've seen that for from the start of his, his career to now. So the, the one thing he is as good as anyone in the game, he's a great problem solver. He finds a way, and that's what he did today. He went back, I think, to his old technique that works and, and just found a way to get through that tough period. And, and as Tubby said, tough runs are the best runs. And he had to work hard today um, for his first 60 runs. His game started to come a lot more easier um, as the innings went on. And he found a, a bit more of that uh, natural flow of his innings. But mate, Steve Smith is unique character. He, that's his 10th 100 against India. His second, as Tubby said, all time with Australia. So he can tinker as much as he likes. He knows what works for him. One for you, Tubby. Is he? He turns 38 on Wednesday. He's out of form, I think that's fair. Does he get the tap on the shoulder and is he told to retire after the Sydney test? Goodness, or will he make it to the end of the Ashes? Well, I, I reckon Australia would love him to get to the end of the Ashes, but he'll need to make some runs between now and I think the end of this series. Australia, the Ashes will be obviously a big, another big series for Australia next summer. Australia only have two test matches in Sri Lanka and three in the West Indies after this after this series. So if he doesn't make any runs in the next two and a half test matches, then George Bailey and the selectors will have to say, do we look to a, a younger person now to give them Sri Lanka and the West Indies? Or do we say to, to Usman, we're going we're gonna to play in no matter what. And if he's that badly out of form, that could be a dangerous strategy. So there's almost a feeling that uh, letting David Warner run through to the end of his career meant that Australia are now in this conundrum of having to find two test openers and, and pretty quickly. that was always a problem when you, when you do that because you also set a benchmark now that you know, players can play for as long as, they, as long as they want and that should never be the case. Who'd be a selector, hey Tubbs? <laughs> no one. <laughs> <laughs> Jake sent through a message on Instagram and he asks, what was the worst conditions you ever played in and more importantly, why weren't you taken off the field? Do you want to answer that, Hads? The worst conditions? Yeah. Uh, well, the worst conditions I've ever played in is actually a shield game in Tasmania, where it was, it was snowing. Freezing? Oh, <laughs> and, and as a wicketkeeper, you're normally in the best position where you can get your hands nice and warm, but yeah. I, I don't know why we're on. I was like a basketball backboard that day. There was n nothing I wanted to catch. It was horrible conditions. There was uh, snow on the mountain. Sleet was coming onto to the ground. Give me the rain any day. Not the snow. Tubby, have you had any, had any shockers? I, I, I'd say um, Chennai and Colombo. Oh. I can remember playing in those two venues and they were really, really hot and humid. And you're standing out there and you're thinking... <laughs> and I remember uh, Tony Dotter made... Uh, actually, this was actually at training one day in Colombo. He was running into bowl and the sweat was squelching through his shoes. And I thought, we, I think we just walked off training and said, that's enough of this. Oh, who said that cricket wasn't an extreme sport? I think you've got the two extremes right there. Jake also adds, I love the podcast. It always puts a smile on my face and wraps up the day's play in the best way possible. Keep going. Well, we certainly will be for the rest of this series, at the very least. And finally, the last question. And Adam, he asks, Dear Brad, there are more than one Adams in this world. Lovely tie. Yes, there is. 
No, I don't know. I don't believe it. <laughs> well, there we go. The end of day two, the third test of the Border Cabasco Trophy. It's all to play for. Australia ahead at the moment, but goodness me, who knows what will come. I'm Izzy Westbury, Mark Taylor, Brad Haddon. Good night from us. Yeah, thanks for watching the Willow Talk podcast on YouTube. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you don't have to miss an episode wherever you are. And while you're at it, check out these videos up here. They're mostly good.